It's the middle of autumn in Tassie and the weather is starting to change. The garden's powering, but it's about to slow down as the temperature begins to drop and the farm prepares for the onset of winter. Oh, hello. You're all coming for a feed. <laughs> Over the next 12 months, our goal is to do everything we can to improve and nourish our farm soil. And after a visit from Hannah, a permaculture expert, we now have a plan to manage our rainwater better so we can stop our soil's nutrients being washed away. So we have to make sure that we have a regenerative approach. So rather than degrading that soil and taking, 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 you're setting it up so it can be almost self-replenishing with your support and help to keep producing these good, nutritious yields indefinitely. It's simple, really. The more we can do to look after the health of our land, the more able it will be to look after us now and hopefully for generations to come. There's really three things I need to get onto, the soil, the water and the blackberries. I've got a plan for the blackberries. It might make it easier and then I'll worry about the nutrients in the soil and, and after that fix the water. So it's just another day on the farm. One man, me, Whoa. taking on the forces of nature. Nothing to worry about, right? My name is Matthew Evans. After years as a big city food critic, I bought a farm in Tasmania to better understand what I eat by growing it myself. I built a restaurant right at the top of the farm, but now I want to get a better understanding of what I eat eats. This means starting from the ground up to improve the health of our soil, our farm and our food for generations to come. From foodie to farmer to chef to rehabilitator of the land, how hard can it be? Autumn's a very beautiful and busy season for the farm, with lots of work harvesting. But with the thousands of blackberry bushes taking hold of our paddocks, I really need to tackle the problem head on today. One of our friends, Jilly, is a blueberry farmer that lives just up the road, and she may have the solution to our blackberry issues. Goats. I guess what we're interested in is trying to control blackberries, which are just taking over. So is it spread over your farm or is it in a specific place? Everywhere. Patches? It's all like it's all along the fence lines, but it's creeping back into the paddocks. Okay. Um, and we really don't want to use, you know, chemical sprays. Yeah. At this oh, stage. They turn into a big problem pretty quickly, don't they? Blackberries were introduced to Tassie over 200 years ago, but today they're seen as a nuisance weed because of the way they compete for the soil's nutrients. So Sadie wanted me to get some goats onto the problem, but I've heard that goats are pretty high maintenance eaters. But if Jilly reckons they have a sweet tooth for blackberry bushes, then it could be the go. So you can see these guys over here are eating blackberries and they're picking the last of the leaves off these plants, which have yeah. they've had a pretty good go out already. They don't let them seed, you know, they'll eat all the fruit. I thought we'd have to look at getting goats, maybe, you know, slash and then get, you know, put something on that are going to eat the young leaves. Yep. But they, they seem to eat old leaves any time of year. Yep. Blackberry leaves are actually a bit of a herb for goats. They're high in tannin and they're high in other nutrient, which helps them with their parasite burden. Right. Um, so it, it's actually really good for them and we've almost got to the stage where we kind of... We don't mind having the blackberries in the paddocks because it, it creates good food over a longer season than what we've got other, some of the other fodder for them. Wow, this sounds too good to be true. Not only are the goats going to be good for the blackberries, but the blackberries are going to be good for the goats. If we were to get into goats, what would we need to know? They need to be on enough food that they just stay a healthy, happy animal. They can be a bit more prone to parasites than some other farm animals. So you need to keep an eye on that. They need good shelter. They need good fences. They need their feet to be trimmed a couple of times a year. Well, they sound pretty good. Yeah. So far, so good. But I'm sure that innocent Tassie smile on Jilly's face is hiding something. I wonder if there are any downsides. If you don't mind them getting into your garden every now and again. I definitely don't want him in the garden. <laughs> you know, Nadia would kill me if they got into the she garden. She would, yeah. That's for sure. They've done a pretty good job here, but um, if they're so good, why are you getting rid of them? Well, they do take quite a bit of work to maintain, to keep a healthy, happy herd. I need a lower maintenance solution to my weed problems. I'm gonna go for machines next time. Hmm. Maybe I should have gone with a machine before promising Sadie these goats. <laughs> But I'm sure Sadie will be a lot happier with a herd of these guys around the place than a herd of lawnmowers. But when it comes to grass maintenance, you can't beat our cows. And autumn and spring are the best times to make butter because grass is green and abundant. 
The yellow colour in butter comes from the beta carotene in the grass. The greener the grass, the richer the butter. This is um, kefir, so they're little granules that ferment. You can get ones that, that can live on sugar and water. This is a, a milk kefir. So they're little balls or little grains, they call them. Um, they're bacteria and yeast combinations and they actually ferment the milk. I want to use them to culture some, uh, some cream to make a cultured butter. Never done it before. Anyway, I just need to drain this off. These granules are actually quite easy to find in local health shops or even online. So a lot of people make a, a like a milk kefir as a probiotic, as a drink. Um, they like the flavour, I don't really love the flavour. But this is going into cream to make cultured cream. So if you add those little granules to cream, it creates uh, like a sour cream, a, a creme fraiche, um, which is too thick and you can't get those the little grains out again. So what I've done, put them in the bag so I can fish them out again, but they're not really tight in the bag so the cream can get all around. I'm going to pop that into my jar. This is just a jar of, of cream from our cows. Now, I'm just popping a lid on there just loosely. That's just to stop anything landing in there. This then sits on the bench overnight. About 24 hours should be enough. And the whole lot of cream cultures the bacteria, the yeast, the good bacteria, the good yeast that exist in those little grains are going to multiply and send all of this um, uh, cream a little bit sour. So when you whip it into butter, you get cultured butter. So it's less waxy, it's got more flavour. Um, it's, a, it's a really lovely butter compared to um, just whipping normal cream to make butter. All right, see you tomorrow. Butter is one thing. But the fermenting process is also a great way of preventing food waste when the garden is producing so many veggies in autumn. This is a real surplus. It's the season. And because we've had such a bumper crop this year, Sadie didn't want to waste our glut of excess tomatoes. So while up in Hobart, she dropped in on Adam James, one of Tassie's most talented fermenters, to see if he'd be up for a trade. Hey, how are you? He's renowned for the wild vegetable ferments that he sells to restaurants around town. Adam has a glut of his own. How's it going? So Sadie is hoping to make a deal for some miso that I need for the kitchen. Wow! Look at your tomatillos. Tomatillo day. Holy yeah, just moly. pick these up off Paulette, actually. These are so beautiful. 25 kilos. Just going to do a bit of a hot sauce with them. Um, yeah, some ricottos. Is that what those are called? Yeah, so these are these are super hot. Oh, cool. So you're going to yeah. put the tomatillos, the chilli, the salt, and then ferment that? I'll ferment that, but I'll probably just process them into more of a paste form. Oh, OK. And then just leave them in the crocs like that. And is it kind just of more to... of a pasty? Exactly, yeah. yeah, just to do their thing. So, yeah, it'll, it'll end up being like a thick hot sauce. Oh, wow. And so you might hit it with some coriander root or something yeah. towards the end and... Yeah. Afterwards, you're not going to ferment the, the coriander no, as in no, later, just, otherwise you'd just, lose that. Exactly, and, and it can just more of an aesthetic thing. The colour can kind of mm. brown it all a little. So I like to hit that at the very end and it keeps its freshness. Yeah. What else are you doing? Um, what have you got going out well, on those crocs? You want to look at the big guys? I want to look at the big crocs. All right. Adam discovered fermentation in 2013 after he tasted some fermented miso paste on a trip to Japan. And since then, he's been fermenting whatever he can get his hands on. I got 77 kilos of um, green tomatoes delivered last kilos. week. Yeah, which was really exciting. So, so is that just green tomatoes and plus just a little and the just, starter? You and just probably... gooseberry boshi to kind of start get that it off. Going. I'm kind of going to see how it develops. Mm. And then I think probably a couple of months down the track, I'll decide where it's going to go and what it needs. Like, ultimately, with what I'm doing, you know, there's, there's never a recipe and everything. Yeah. Nothing's ever going to be replicated. Check this guy out. This is um, ricotta, so the same chilies. Whoa. But we've got about 100 litres there. And I've just wow. hit that recently with um, a whole bunch of uh, turnips and, and oh, early like squash. Oh, that's what I can smell is the turnips. Yeah, so it really adds a beautiful depth of flavour by adding vegetables. Like, yeah. I'd never use any fillers like you know, vinegars or sugar or, you know, people use xanthan gum and all yep. these kind of, yep, yep. you know, additives. So for me, it's always straight vegetables, um, sometimes a little bit of filtered water, but generally it's just the vegetables themselves and then thyme. And, and that's pureed. What about salt? Is there salt in there? Definitely salt. Yeah. But I, I do do it by taste. Like I've, 
yeah, I'm not one for sitting there and weighing and measuring. I kind of like to do things instinctively and generally it kind of works out all right. It kind of works out okay. Yeah. Lots of chilli sauces are fermented in one way or another. For instance, Tabasco and Chiracha are fermented to get their unique depth of flavour, as well as preserving them. What, um, what, what can I do to barter? What are you hoping for? Um, have you got any more miso? Like that really beautiful plain miso? The genmai? So the like genmai? The, the soybean yeah. based one, the traditional one? Just the traditional one? Yeah, totally. And then I tasted um, one of your ferments a friend had that had tur turnip tops in it, I think. The turnip, yeah. With, um, so it's turnip top. Um, with fresh turmeric and yeah, that sounds, um, that spring sounds, garlic. Yeah, that sounds like it. It's almost it like quite... kind of curry pasty. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That big, would be big, big awesome. tub of each of those? Yes, please. Unreal. Yes, please, yes, please. Now that's what I call a classic Tassie business transaction. Fresh tomatoes for the best miso you'll ever eat. With autumn comes new pigs, and one of my sows, Evita, is almost ready to give birth. Hello, darling. I haven't got any food for you. It's OK. You're a bit nervous. I know. So Evita's a, a first-time mum, and she's just built a nest inside her shelter, so gone around and gathered lots of long grass and built quite a, a big nest. She probably doesn't know what's going on, but she's got this overwhelming instinct to, to build things, you know, this, this area that's going to be safe for her babies. Um, she'll probably give birth in the next 24, 36 hours, I'd imagine, but you can see she's more up for a scratch right now than, than um, giving birth. Hey, leave you to it. Fridays on the farm mean that the kitchen is getting ready for our lunch service. The cream has been fermenting overnight and should now have a great flavour and be ready to turn into butter. This is the cream that we cultured yesterday with that um, kefir grains. So it's gone like a sour cream, not as thick as I thought it might be. Whoa. This is the bag full of grains. You can see how it's grown. They've grown a little bit, but then there's also a lot of cream in there now. And I'm going to tip that cream into my butter churn. So it's cultured. So it's a little bit um, chunky. It's the sort of thing like milking a cow, you can't rush it. As a food, butter's origins go back about 10,000 years to the time when our ancestors first began domesticating animals. Ancient tribes of Asiatic India would also burn it in lamps as a source of light and even smear it on their skin to protect from the cold. What we're trying to do with this is turn cream into butter, so we're trying to get rid of the liquid part. The liquid part is called buttermilk, strangely. It's such a simple pleasure to make your own butter, and once the curds have separated from the whey, it's pretty much ready. The washing process is really complicated um, in a factory, probably. But what we do, we take water and we put it over that unformed butter, the stuff that looks like ricotta, and that'll wash out a whole bunch more buttermilk. You're only washing it because the buttermilk's going to go off. So if I want to keep the butter for any more than two, three days, I need to wash it a bit. The more buttermilk you remove, the longer it should last, but it never lasts long when there's fresh bread around. That liquid's a lot more clear. Now, I've got rid of most of the moisture, a tiny bit left. That won't matter. Now's when I add my salt. You have the butter, you get the occasional crunch and um, sparkle of salt through the butter. Right. So these paddles are used to press out that buttermilk, but you can also sh use it to shape the butter. So you can see there's a little bit of moisture in there. That's absolutely fine for us. But if you're going to keep it for weeks and weeks, you wouldn't want any moisture at all. All right, that uh, is a block of beautiful homemade butter, which we'll use at lunch today. Yeah. Come on. 
The end of autumn is a great time for us to plan what we're going to plant in spring. Australia has been farmed using European principles for the last 200 years in a way that's completely degraded the soil. But the First Nations people managed the land sustainably for tens of thousands of years. So the question is, is there a way for me to reverse 200 years of soil degradation using edible native plants while still feeding my family and servicing the restaurant? To get a bit of an insight, I'm off to visit local Indigenous expert Chris Schaefer, who's something of a guru when it comes to establishing edible native gardens. G'day Chris. Thanks for doing this. Pleasure. Now, this is your garden. Is this a garden or is this a forest? Both. Both. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> yeah, right. Joe and I um, have been talking for a long time about doing edible natives in a garden just outside our building. Mm. Is there stuff here you can show me? Yes. Um, we've got Kunzia. Yeah. Kunzia, Kunzia ambigua. Yeah. This is it here. Mm hmm. We can harvest it straight yeah, away. Yeah, right. Mm. It's got a really distinctive flavour yeah. and uh, it's good for arthritis. Wow, that bit was almost peppery. It's got citrus notes, it's got savoury notes. It'd be fantastic with them um, in a salami or with, um, yes. over the, the, the open side of a prosciutto yes. or something yes. like that. Yes, perfect. Wow, that's yeah. delicious. There we go. Can I, can I keep that? You may. <laughs> this farm is completely different from any I've ever seen. I haven't spotted a recognisable paddock or fence of any kind. I've already got an idea of how I could use kunzia in the kitchen, and it's only the first plant I've looked at. Chris has four acres of garden with countless edible varieties, so it's going to be really hard to make a choice. I wonder if this is something I could do on Fat Pig Farm, a wildlife wonderland of edible native plants. Remember, I looked, there's something in a pot. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, what are they? Tasmania lanceolata, bush pepper. Are there different varieties? There are different forms, yes. They can grow right from sea level up to subalpine. So we've got small leaf alpine forms and then the larger, this is the more common form. How long from when I, if I put a plant in to when I would, might get seed? Sometimes we can have them flowering in their first year in the pots. Right. Give me some culinary uses that you might. Native pepper ice cream. Yeah, right. We've got a little ice cream machine, but I'll give it a crack. Good. It's really good. Pepperberry ice cream is something I've always wanted to try and would be great on our summer menu in the restaurant. I wonder what else is here. Oh, this is like a nursery. <laughs> what are all these things? Um, we've got our small leaf pig face. It's another one of our edible but uh, medicinal plants as well. Right. We've got other... Um, oh, that's gorgeous. Native violets, so edible flowers. Perfect. I like that sort of stuff. Beautiful in the garden, good in a salad. Yep. How are these going to work in terms of soil structure, soil health? Every plant has got that quality of sort of giving back to the soil. It's bringing all of those microbes, those um, mycorrhizals. Healing the soil while growing perennial things for the kitchen. Yeah. Which is actually, yeah. Yeah, that's ticking two boxes straight away. Yeah. And autumn's kicked off, so we should get start getting stuff that's in right. soon. That's yeah. right. All right. Yeah. Well, I better go and prepare the ground. Off you go. <laughs> Dig those holes. Oh, real? It's so good to see Chris's garden. I guess when I see things in pots in a garden centre or here, I think of the potential. But seeing how her gardens come up, and that shows me the potentials for, for our edible native garden. It's not just an idea, it's soon going to become reality. In a former life, Fat Pig Farm was used as an apple orchard, but those farming practices were pretty harsh on the soil. So to nourish our earth, we want to plant a native garden right here outside the restaurant with fresh, truly local flavours on tap for the kitchen. This is the stuff I got from Chris's garden and I'm pretty keen to try out this Quinzia. I had an idea for how that sort of citrusy, savoury note might go really well in a dish. What I want to do is use uh, these Japanese turnips. They're a Hakurai turnip. It's called a turnip. It's not like those you know, European ones that you might have had that are bitter and strong. Sometimes these Japanese turnips uh, aren't quite as crisp and you can actually poach them. But these ones are sweet and crunchy, which I think will go really nicely for this time of year. Oh. <laughs> mm. 
Miso is a fermented um, rice uh, paste. Uh, it can have soybeans in and all sorts of stuff. Um, this one's quite pungent. It's really just rice and vegetables fermented with salts, probably for a year at least, I'd say. That's really good. So I'm just going to tip them into a dish. Just finely sliced radish. This is adding pepperiness, which I really like. Now, this stuff. I reckon I've got snagged on this one. I've been bushwalking a thousand times and didn't know it was edible, or maybe I've just got snagged on other things that look like this. It doesn't look like the most interesting uh, bush in the world, but I've got to say that flavour. Kunzia is used like a herb and has similar qualities to rosemary. And then some salt. The salt will, it acts like sandpaper. It actually helps it grind in a mortar. Right, and then we just pound it. it smells like the Australian bush. One of them, anyway. It's broken down really quickly, much quicker than I thought it would. I guess it's a, a reasonably firm um, herb, so there's not a lot of moisture in there. And oh, this lovely green powder. Wow. Now, to finish my dish, a sprinkle of this Kunzia. A uh, remarkably um, elegant and pretty thing, which I don't normally do, but um, there you go. Planting a garden of native edibles like Kunzia will bring a whole new palette of flavours to the restaurant and actually nourish our soils at the same time. I think that's a pretty elegant method of land management. And every bit as sophisticated will be how our new goats will manage our blackberry infestation. And now that I'm committed, there are a few things I need to get done before they arrive. So, goats are due tomorrow. These are the blackberries that I want them to eat. But with the weather closing in, it's getting colder. I need to set up a shelter for them. I reckon I might use that shed there. Our farmhand, Phil, has already got a start on the shed. So between the two of us, I'm sure we can come up with a plush hotel for our goats. You think we might be tempting fate a bit, Matthew? What's that? With the goats over there and the hay over here. Yeah, it could a bit. It worries me, but I can't get this hay to anywhere else. We need somewhere warm for the goats to protect themselves, but the only place that I have is the hay shed. I hope they really love blackberries, because if they get into my hay, there's going to be trouble. We're pulling out all the stops on this five-star accommodation. Not one expense spared. You ever had goats? No. Uh, what you know about them, do you reckon they can climb? Definitely. So the pallet they'd climb, and this, well, that, they'd just go straight through that? I'd say so, yep. If you like having possums, do you reckon, if we put metal? It should stop them. The first bit? All right. I don't know what we're going to fix it to. I mean, this bit's OK. This, bit, this bit's easy. Seriously, are they going to jump up here? <laughs> We're not buying mountain goats. No, that's all right. Is that undoing? <laughs> so the only thing they want to do is rub against it. They can't climb. Pretty tough. I can reach at least six hay bales. Pretty good. Should do the job. Yeah. So that's the uh, the shelter. So rather than build a whole new shelter because the winds here are phenomenal, I'd have to probably concrete it into the ground, um, use this one. So I've got hay ready to feed them. I'll move these pallets out of the way. They can use the old hay for bedding. Lovely and sheltered in here. And then they've got this absolute smorgasbord of, of uh, blackberries to eat right outside their front door. We're only halfway through autumn, but I feel like things are starting to come together. We've got goats on the way, the soil tests are in, so fingers crossed, our master plan for fixing up the farm might even work. There we go. Come and have a look at this. Even better. Mmm. This is our garden, so it's two acres. So the blackwoods will actually give nitrogen to the soil. 